Welcome to 155, a podcast about one punk song, The Decline, by No Effects. My name is Josiah Hughes. And I'm Sam Sutherland. And this week we were talking about the one punk song that we talk about, and that is The Decline by No Effects. That's right. We're kind of like the Peter Jackson, uh, um, the Beatles series, but we're just yeah, about this is, to we've do- timed this kind of correctly. The zeitgeist is demanding hours long explorations of singular pieces of, of art. And that is what the decline is. And you know, we are in many ways, the Peter Jackson of Canada, my wife, Peter uh, Sarah does a really good Peter Jackson impression. Uh, although of, of, a lot I don't really of, think I know how Peter Jackson talks besides the fact that he would have like a funny accent. Yeah. A New Zealand. I don't, I don't really know what constitutes in your mind, what constitutes a good Peter Jackson impression. Also, like I met, this is just for like two people, but I met like the worst New Zealand person ever recently. <laughs> so if you if you know, you Taiko know. Watiti? <laughs> no, it wasn't him. But that is what I say when I need to go to the bathroom. I need to take a wee <laughs> Titi. Um, I, I just want to make clear that I, I like Taika Watiti. That's the, the joke was that when, you don't appreciate him. I like. I he's okay. He just kind of needs to come up with a new thing. Maybe. I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I fair. think Sarah's uh, Peter Jackson impression is good because. I, I mean, maybe it's just because I, it's my wife, you know, I just kind of, my, my heart flutters when I hear it, but <laughs> Which I, will, I will say to criticize, <laughs> my one critique of her impression is that it does <laughs> open with her, her saying, hi, I'm Peter Jackson. So it's kind of, <laughs> right. Okay. Not necessarily <laughs> how, how you want to sort But of he would say that if you were, if he was up. introducing himself, he probably would say that. I bet that. he would. I bet he's modest enough. He wouldn't necessarily assume that he knew who he was. You know, he's, he's, he's a famous director, but ultimately still, you know, man who lives behind the lens. Does Does Sarah do any other impressions, or is Peter Jackson kind of her, She's her really primary good. target, <laughs> satirical target? Most of her impressions involve her saying the name Peter because <clears throat> she also does Lois from Family Guy, but she just says Peter <laughs> in Lois's voice. So fact, she's just really good at saying like Peter's a word that she's kind of figured she out. Can how do to, all how the to, Family Guy characters just saying the word Peter? <laughs> It's really good. Wow. This is exciting. I wonder what other famous Peter she could work on an impression of. Like uh, Peter Benchley would love to hear uh, her, her Peter Benchley impression. Similarly, uh, I have no idea what he what he talks like. I don't even remember uh-huh. who that is. But anyways, we're talking about the decline for an entire month. This is just something that I've been what excited about. Decline Sember? Decline what, yeah, who what gives it called? A sh- I mean, I think so. Whatever. Who gives a shit, really? But Branding I- is important. <clears throat> Let's go, Branding. Uh it's kind of a <laughs> reference to that thing. That was actually pretty good. I already tweeted that last week, so oh, kind of I see. It was it. a callback, um, self callback. But I've, I've honestly, like the guest that's on the show this week, the idea of talking yeah. about it this long, the idea of this month will conclude with a large, enormous uh, cover of the decline. That's an exquisite corpse from everybody from the Discord, kind of each taking a little piece of it. And putting their own spin on it. So there's a lot of like uh, pop punk brain damage about to happen. But I honestly have been dreaming of this. Like, I, I feel like for a year, like, I feel like years ago, I thought, in fact, uh, I was, when I was doing like the Twitter search, and I think we'll talk ab- about Twitter quite a bit, but when I was doing it for, f- to prepare for this, I saw that I, I think I tweeted about, I'm just gonna go ahead and give away that we've got someone from Godspeed talking about uh, what? the decline this week. And I, I noticed that from myself, I've been calling The Decline a Godspeed song for many years. Um, really? Yeah. I, you know, like... What's the first instance? Let's see. 2014. Uh, November 2014. Oh, wow. I said, the best Godspeed you Black Emperor song is The Decline by No Effects. I mean, what a beautiful... <laughs> It's a very simple tweet, you know, it's probably... Did you get a lot of traction on that? No, not really. I didn't get too much traction back then. I, I, I didn't really... I mean, that's kind of like... It's before you'd found your niche. That's kind of almost like a proto Eve 6 tweet, really. But uh, the Eve 6 guy is too dumb wow. to do that kind of, that kind of shit, <laughs> I think. But, you know, I'm just saying this has been... This in my... In specifically in my mind palace, this has been in the works for a very long time. But I guess before... like we're And we're going to do kind of... I think we're going to just do the Wake the Dead model, if you remember the Wake the Dead episode. We're just going to kind of, kind of listen together. I do. And talk about the parse. I was talking to the listener at that point. But um, I mean, oh, I'm okay. glad, I am glad that you remember something we've done. I remember. I don't remember much, but I remember <laughs> the, the, the Comeback Kid episode. Did you know that the license plates in Quebec say uh, 
Wait, what do they say in Ontario? Like in the border? They say, in, in, in Ontario, they say yours to discover, and in Quebec, they say just pour rear. No, they say je me souviens, which means I remember. Or maybe it yeah, means do you just, remember? Just, 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 just pour rear. Just, just pour souvenir rear. Just souvenir. Mm. It's fine. You can keep going. Apparently, it's something to do with like uh, protecting the French language and remembering it. But I just love how it's just like, to me, it's just so like vague and poetic. Like Quebec, I remember, uh, and this kind of what I, <laughs> what I like to do. Um, but any- it feels like it could be like a like a real sloganeering, you know, like a like a Bain, like a Fr- Franco Bain kind of course. <laughs> yeah, like- Frank. <laughs> <laughs> once I learn, once I learn uh, about Bain, man, do you remember? Do you remember the funny guy that I was just telling you about meeting over the weekend? I don't want to dox this guy, but the very humorous man that uh, you know who I'm talking about. I was just telling of course, you about yeah. um, I, I was saying to him that I, I've found everyone here so accommodating of me being Anglo and not knowing French, and I really appreciated it because I was always intimidated. And he was like. Yeah, I mean, it's really not that big a deal. All you got to do is just like straight up learn French and become bilingual and then you'll be fine. (laughs) So good. Yeah, not a drama. Uh, Anyways, I guess what I'm saying is this feels like a culmination of my life's work in some way this week, this month, really. Uh, But before we get into it, before we break it down, I want to know your history with the decline and I want to share mine with you as well. But I'd like to know for you first, like what's your your kind of vibe? What's your decline vibe? My decline vibe is I remember downloading this song, like being in... in je me souviens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was Je, je me souviens uh, Napster and had heard about it and kind of read about it. But I, but I don't think I, I really sort of understood how fucking sick it was going to be. Because someone that I knew, someone I was in the Etobicoke Youth Band with... Um, which was a community concert band that I performed in through high school as an extracurricular had told me that it wasn't really like one big song. It was kind of just like a bunch of songs sort of slapped together with transitions. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, that's not that impressive. Cause initially I was like, Oh, like an 18, how long is it? 18 minutes. Yeah, it's 18, 18, 20, like an eight, 18 minute pop punk song. That's crazy. And so I illegally downloaded it and was like, okay, that person's a fucking Idiot. Like, this is a full on, well orchestrated 18 minute work. Like, this is a work. This is not a song. And from that day forward, I've just, A, I think it's like the best no effects song. B, I think it's one of the best pop punk songs ever written. I think it's incredible that they did it once and then felt no reason to ever prove that they were that talented again. Like, there have been good no effects songs since then, but the idea that ultimately this song was in them and then they were just sort of good i fucking respect even though i mean i don't know that i want more the decline but it is interesting to me how few bands have made an attempt to to recreate what this song is and so uh, the bottom line is like i listen to the song kind of on the regular i think it fucking rocks once or twice i've seen friends cover it like i remember the, the flatliners can basically play it one time at a at a basement show at a house that a bunch of you know, punks used to live in on Gray Street, the Gray Street Sport and Social Club. Um, They just sort of on a lark made it through, I think about nine minutes before they all started to kind of forget the specifics, not how it went, but how it Just kind of like jamming it out, like just improv Just jamming it out in the basement, just like everyone kind of, like they all kind of know how it goes and just sort of did it until the wheels fell off and it was like fucking incredible. Um, You know, that's, that's it. I've just, it's, it's the best. There's a reason why we're dedicating an entire month to it. What about you? Because I, I wish I remembered, like, literally the first time I heard it, that kind of moment. But it's more that I remember this process of being kind of hearing about it, being told one thing, that thing being fucking wrong, and slowly but surely it just being something that has um, become a fixture in my life. Yeah. Well, I have, a, yeah, I have, like, very distinct memories of it. I'm trying to find something, but I, I can't find it right now while I talk. But basically, I remember very clearly... So my dad used to be like a uh, professor of Old Testament specifically, like religious studies stuff. But he was very like um, he was very kind of cutting edge, and he really collaborated a lot with the philosophy department at school too. And I remember he he got a grant to work on a 
a chapter of some literary journal or something with his uh, writing partner who was from the philosophy department. And so they went to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is also where Paul Schrader went. So uh, shout out to uh, The Card Counter, another fantastic outing from one of the worst posters on Facebook, I think. But anyways, um, so I remember he went out to Grand Rapids, Michigan for like a summer when I was a little kid in the late 90s. Uh, and and then my family flew out there and visited, and that's like when I went to Niagara Falls for the first time. Um, <clears throat> and then we we went to Detroit. So I, I have this distinct memory of like kind of and similarly through my dad, I learned about Adbusters, which I loved specifically in like a Mad Magazine way at first. Kind of like learning about you know I, I just thought of it as like parodies of culture, the the uh, culture jamming that they did. Um, so it, it was kind of like gags to me at first, but um, I can't find the issue. Anyways, I, I had like a bunch of Adbusters magazines back then. And on this trip, I had um, the Adbusters. It was called like the Corporate Eye or something. It was basically this like, you know, a super vibey. I forget what's on the cover of that issue, but some sort of vibey graphic design. And then the article was about how like in court, a corporation is an individual. And so they can on their behalf of a corporation, you can kind of argue the rights of an individual person. And I remember just like being so bored at Calvin College, like reading this whole article where I, where I would normally just look at the pictures and then like actually kind of understanding some of it. And it kind of like shifted me anyway. So that was one element of this trip. And the other element was we went to, we went into Detroit with my mom and we like stopped at a UCD store and my brother and I bought the decline for $10 and um, that was so crazy because, as we remember in Canada, the import fees were like thirty dollars, or it would always be like so expensive. So just getting anything on Fat Rec for that cheap was exciting. And then we were just like playing ping pong, me and my brother Johnny, in like this, uh, you know, this academic institution where where my dad was writing for a literary journal, and I had just read about the corporate eye. So I was like, I feel like this was like sort of some kind of uh, you know, p- borderline <laughs> leftist awakening <laughs> that happened uh, <laughs> with the decline. This is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So that like I have this distinct memory of like playing playing ping pong and and just being like absolutely blown away by this music. And also, you know, like I've said before, I've always been kind of lost between loving bad pop punk and bad hardcore and also loving very pretentious things. So even back then, I think it did scratch the itch because I feel like I probably already had Lift Your Skinny Fists uh, by Godspeed. So it did kind of like sew something together. Everything kind of just like clicked that summer, you know? I ruled that one summer, man. That one summer. Yeah, I'm really turning into an old man where every t- every week I talk about a different <laughs> magical summer. <laughs> like the fun Honestly, I'm old because I'm just totally enchanted by it. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is the content that I personally <laughs> crave being on the receiving end of. Yeah, and I think like I, you know, I listened to it a lot for many years, and then it became kind of a funny thing because I think the reason that the decline is funny, we'll get into the lyrics as we break it down. But I think one of the reasons is that it's just so well, like it's so incredibly well done. Like most people who are in any kind of band have never written anything as mind-blowingly good as The Decline. It's so, the way that different even musical themes like emerge and then disappear and re-emerge later on, like as a piece of music, it's just kind of baffling. Well, and that's and that's the thing that kind of made me mad about someone telling me that it wasn't really one song, is that it completely is. And it reminds me so much of like, It's like classical music or musical theater where there are these themes that like, you know, are are sort of reimagined and repurposed kind of like later on as counter melodies or as a way to sort of draw disparate pieces together. And what made it, again, to, to me ironic, the connection in my mind being talking about it in the context of concert band where like that was the sort of music that we were playing and at that time in my life or like once a week or, or, you know, more often than that or whatever, you're actually like performing. I mean, I guess calling it classical music is a stretch, but you know, like concert band music. And then also having this innate interest in musical theater from such a young age. And then hearing all of that in a song that talked about, and spoiler alert, we will obviously spend, and I think you've talked about this on, on 
this pod and other pods before transposing all of those sort of uh, seemingly far away musical ideas into a song about the greedyocracy is so fucking sick. And again, there are not a lot of like, sometimes on these like pop punk concept albums, you'll have like sort of returning melodies. And, and, and often that is done in a, in a way that I love because I'm simple like that. But it'll be an outro. You'll hear like the the melody of another song in a piano or in a coda. Some some stuff might return, and that sort of is what passes for ambitious, typically in the context of of pop punk. And here is the song that feels like it is rooted in such like classical, um, again, like the the structure of of a of a musical work as opposed to a song. And it's fucking insane. Like, it's again, it's so insane that it's no effects that did this. Like, I get when people are like, oh, the sweeping ambition of a My Chemical Romance song. Like, I don't fucking care. Yeah. No effects did all of those things. And again, they only did it once. I mean, I will say this. No effects, when I forget about all of the many, many, many things that annoy me about them, they do have this, like, totally totally spoken down and like almost sweep swept under the rug this like profound musicality to them where there's like Ooh. harmonies and counter harmonies totally. and like super there's there is like classical uh scales and whatnot they're like i feel like it is harder to just sit down and like play a no effect song from memory than it is you know no, that's almost totally any true. other they're, kind of they're much more uh, like of a nuanced band that I think they get credit for, which is mostly just because I think the prototypical no effects fan is not a subtlety appreciator. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and, and, and that's kind of the beauty of the decline is that there is, you can read it subtly or you can read it kind of like maximally and either way it delivers constantly. So one more thing before we hit play uh, is that, um, you know, we talk about it as a classical suite kind of, you know, today I got a rejection notice from, uh, the disintegration loops, William Basinski, who politely de- declined to speak about the decline, but I had presented mm-hmm. it to him. Like it was a suite, a classical suite, um, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because smart. I think it is, but you know, whatever it's, that's, that's fine. But anyways, for fat Mike, what he has been quoted as saying is, um, and he talks about sort of how much of a nightmare it was to record this and how it's been r- written and recorded so many times. And, I mean, sorry, re-recorded and remastered so many times. And I think th- their uh, recording engineer, Ryan Green, this was the first thing he did on Pro Tools or something. I mean, also, it's fucked that this is from 1999. Like, that's just insane <sighs> to me. That this it is so insane, and there's like obviously deep history on this in terms of like how like the, they were had to hack the technology to make this song work. Like this would be much easier to do today. Yeah, but the '90s. That's fucked. It's also funny how it's like a pre 9 11 thing. Like what? Wh- where did this even come? Maybe he also read the corporate eye issue of Adbusters, which I can't even find. I mean, probably. Right I think every, everyone did back then. I can't believe I still see Adbusters sometimes. Like when I go to like a magazine store, I'm trying to like look for like bougie fashion magazines, and then I see the trying fucking, to look for Monocle. I'm trying to look for uh, nasty porno. No, just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> Adbusters is what I used to. That imported a, imported porno. I used Adbusters porno. as an aid of of that. <laughs> um, but just, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like just nasty Ronald McDonald <laughs> covered in corporate logos. Actually, there's two more things I need to say before we start. So he's also quoted as saying, "It ain't no rock opera. Like song remains the same or nothing." Uh, why would you talk like that in writing? It's disgusting. But anyways, he says we got the idea from Subhumans, not Rush. So that's something that I've never really seen anyone talk about before. Is that uh, Subhumans from the Cradle to the Grave? is actually the influ- the main influence of the decline because this is a uh, 16 minute subhuman song but I don't think we'll listen to the whole thing but it does seem like if you skip around there's like it does you know It definitely seems similarly progressive. Sounds like the subhumans. Yeah, and it sounds I can hear a little bit of the decline in there. There's some of that, uh, some of that stuff. Then the other thing is the phys- So the other thing that blew my mind was the CD of the decline was a fan CD, which is what they described. 
a mini CD that is able to be played in a regular CD player because the outside of it is clear. Like, did you ever have fancy? Right, that's CDs? what I, I never owned it, but I remember seeing it. And I got a shout out uh, back. Jordan, Jordan Lane, who listens to the pod, his old band, kind of a legendary Calgary uh, post hardcore band, the Corda Vita, they also had a fan CD. And those two CDs were the, when I saw both of those, I was like, we need to do this for. So the Fun 100 and the Hand split CD is also a fan CD um, because it's just like the coolest shit ever. And then on top of that, the initial pressing of clear vinyl of this was limited to 155 copies. Oh, of course, they knew. So Refused to do the pod, but definitely down to acknowledge <laughs> its existence. <laughs> Back then, when we were both 14, they, they wrote the... They, wrote, they knew. Yeah, they wrote it down. So, I don't know. Let's listen to the decline. We can just kind of like pause when we feel like it, and we'll probably just get through a little bit. Of, I mean, once we get to the word greedyocracy, pretty much we're, we're fucked because I got a lot to say. But let's <laughs> yeah, check there, it out. There's going to be a whole app uh, about, about greedyocracy for sure. Okay, so here we go. Oh, what a big intro, right? Oh. It's so sick. The drums? Yeah. Okay, I already got a pause because uh, there's something about the intro and something that's a theme that comes up throughout is that this song feels to me, there's something about it that makes me think of soccer or like a World Cup jam. Like it comes up later with some of the counter rhythms of the outro, but even the drums at the start, like I feel there's something very like global sounding about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think like okay, you can pause it again. Because I, I to me, it's so obvious why we both like because uh, we have done a No Effects song previously, and it was uh, during Epifab Month. What we thought was like the, a huge No Effects song, uh, we threw gasoline on the fire from Punkorama Three, and that has such a similar feel to to this mm-hmm. opening. But I love the idea of that like the the kind of like hokey like sound effect intro feeling like it's going big right into the teeny tiny tippy tappy tappy on the on the hatties (laughs) and then like getting ready for the incoming bass onslaught even the the pre pre sort of uh rock and riffing on the bass the bass chords (sighs) are so beautiful like there's just such tenderness to the bass chord yeah and then it gets rocking. Some definitely oh. flea vibes there. Also, like, I love hits, right? To me, the best thing about... It's like why I like Manin so much. Because when you go to a show and there are hits and you can, like, point to them, it's kind of like a way of indicating that you know how the song goes. And so I think, like, a good punk song should have hits that you can do, like, a... Da, 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 so you can, like, jab at the air. I mean, I think the, to me, that's like punk 101 is big hits. But you know, hit, quiet hit, hits hits can be like hits are pandery, and I feel like you need to earn them. And that's why in this mm. song, there are so many hits that are earned by being very complicated. Like there's a lot going on. True. These are early hits, early easy hits. What does he say there? I was I was gonna ask. What? <laughs> Watch me. What is it? I guess I should pull. It's not the even. Lyrics, it's right? not even in the. Li- it's not listed. <laughs> I mean, is and that's that's obviously that's Eric, right? That's not. That's not yeah, Mike. That's not that Mike. feels like a like a smelly. How is that not in the lyrics? Yeah. <laughs> can we can we rewind it? Let's yeah. Let's, let's, see let's if we slow, maybe we can slow it down. Yeah. 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 Oh man, no, be no one's gonna listen to this episode. <laughs> this month of episodes. <laughs> no, this is a this is Rock Band? Watch me. I feel like it's watch I maybe it's because I've got Uptown Funk in the head from my uh, Godspeed <laughs> <laughs> Uptown Funk other but I feel like he says well, watch me. We're on watch together. It's me it's That's like it. a, a don't believe me just watch proto reference but mm, I kind of hate this part honestly no this part rocks because this is the deceptive like oh I'm just listening to a run of the mill like, Nothic song yeah okay hold on let's uh there, there's the little shunu and it like so so I don't I don't agree with you I think that the intro being like 
sick, big, quote unquote, epic into what feels very much like a paint by numbers, no effects, kind of just like skate punk chord progression and song is perfect because it lulls you into a sense of oh, comfort. Well, I'm not complaining about like, I, I think in the context of this, again, this is how I feel about Godspeed is like sometimes there'll be a seven minute section of a song that I kind of hate. But then if the when it pays off melodically or with like some big crescendo, it, it's worth it. So I, in the same right. way, okay. I feel okay. like this, I see, I see, I see. this being like some nasty butt metal skate riff, I don't like that part in particular, but it just makes it even me- even better when he does sing the most perfect opening lyrics of all time. Like that, I think that I, I really do think that's <laughs> honestly like the probably more influential on my entire life, those lyrics than I've ever even realized. But that's like such a perfect, it's a great rhyme and it's such it's a, a great gr- rhyme and <laughs> being presented so in good. the form of, of two questions makes it so like kind of, lo- uh, it's like lamenting kind of, it's like so like. <laughs> It's so serious. It feels like you've you've ascended, you know, some great path, like you know, a, a mountain path, seeking, a, you know, unknowable knowledge. And you're like, okay, I get two questions: one, where, where are these people from, and two, how, how did they, you know, like it is. There's something <laughs> burning and eternal about that question, right? Like you know, I was thinking about this recently. I was, I was, I was. I was uh, running some errands, you know, in a car, driving around a, like a park, a big box kind of parking lot. And you're just like, does no one know how to drive? Like, how often do you find yourself in a situation where you're like, where, like, where, like, how do you live, you know, when you're surrounded by so many stupid people? And it's so true, especially when you're young and you like think you're smarter than everyone. And then you get knocked down a peg or two and then you get, older and you basically have the same bullshit attitude again where you're sort of calcified and you're like everyone except me <laughs> is fucking stupid it's true shit. though i mean it is true for myself uh, about that um but oh no, yeah of course yeah I, th- I think like and that's the thing is there are a lot of lyrics that are worthy of uh mockery in this 18 minute song but there are also so many lyrics that just really hit home with like uh profound truths and this is absolutely a perfect way to start the song and then i think he immediately starts to feel a little bit classist by saying uh bread on purple mountain range and then this part is like so tragedy sounding yeah Oh, okay. So, because that is really like the first. I think like that that tragedy octave chord is kind of the first thing that really becomes like a recurring motif throughout the song. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely, and I didn't realize that. So smelly there says blame it on, and I always I just always went, bah, 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 but that's what it is. <laughs> There we go. This is an important uh, learning opportunity for both of us. Yeah, it just it, turns out you can just read genius.com. Uh, and then and it, can, yeah, it's, it's right there in the title. But they still don't know what he's yelling at the start. So that's. that's I know. Well, no, you figured it out. Didn't you say it was. I, it was, I think it was Don't Believe Me, Just said. Watch at the start. Right. After right. You thought it was. <laughs> that! You're like, that's a full he's like, sentence. God, for sure. speed just dropped. Um, okay. Uh, where are we? Blame it on. I mean, that's still so good. Blame it on human nature. All right. <laughs> yeah, just like. So, uh, All right. so Josiah, we've talked about greedyocracy a lot on this podcast. Now, I don't know that I necessarily, in the context of an 18 minute no effect song, isolated this phrase as being especially funny. Like as a young person, I was just like, cool. I, I would blame it on greedyocracy. Why not? 
when did you fully hone in on greedyocracy as kind of the the thesis word of this song and perhaps of your entire life? I think I honestly think that even when I was uh, playing ping pong, listening to this with my brother, it immediately stood out as the funniest thing ever because I still have always thought like epithet punk politicking is so funny and I still think so. And it's like so perfectly stupid because it doesn't rhyme at all. It's just, it's nothing. It doesn't even like work. Like what, in what world do you turn democracy into greedyocracy? It doesn't even make sense. Like, it's just like, it's such a powerful uh, non sequitur that it just kind of, it's transcendent. It's so stupid. And I think it really does piece together like the most cynical read of this song is just being a song about how, you know, the bad guys are bad and we should become the good guys instead or whatever. Like it's just kind of, this is where I think immediately where it's just a lament about stupid people and not understanding why they're so dumb. That almost keeps it more personal. Whereas greedyocracy immediately becomes like, you know, to bring it back to a recent important episode, the from a hundred government song, you know, it's kind of just like, <laughs> right. it's just like, so like grade nine read of, uh, it's just like it's just a perfect. I don't know. It's just it reminds me of someone who gets a barcode uh, tattoo on their neck, or it's like prison <laughs> hands through the barcode. I mean, it's definitely speaks to I think on some level a more uh, innocent time in all of our uh, you know universally. I'm assuming everyone had the same sort of process of becoming awakened to the, to the real greedyocracy, you know, it, it, it feels very nineties to be like, okay, we think we're living in a democracy where we're ruled by demo tape culture. But in fact, <laughs> we're living in a greedyocracy where we're ruled by greed. Demos don't, demos don't matter at all. Like it, it feels revelatory in the way that, you know, if you were looking for a name for your high school band, you know, and, and trying right. to like what's what like what says you know all our songs are about greed and how it's been and has corporations like what's what what spells that out you know so I guess is is demos and democracy is that like Latin or Greek? Well, that's actually what I was going to say. Is like is it even like I, I was joking about demo tapes, but does demos uh, Greek? So what it's Greek. That? So democracy has origins in Greek language. So how would you say Greek? Yeah, obviously. I mean, that's not obvious to Doi. me. <laughs> so here's how um, you would say greed in Greek. You're not going to be able to hear this, but the listener will be able to. Apistia. Apistia. Apistiaocracy. Apistiaocracy would be greedyocracy. Apistia. Okay, so I guess uh, uh, the Greek word uh, demos, I guess, means people. And crazy means crazy. So, you know, crazy people do things like vote for Trump. Um, but this is pre Trump. This is pre, this is even pre Well, no, I'm just riffing now. I'm just, I'm, but I'm saying like, I actually didn't understand the origin of the word democracy. And so I feel like perhaps our listeners also might not, some of them, some of our. My, so you were, so dumbs. when you just dunked on me for not knowing that it was Greek, you were joking? Or you did know it was Greek. No, I was saying I was saying you don't you don't need to tell people it's Greek. Obviously it's Greek, but, but I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> we're I all thought starting it might at be the Latin. point. <laughs> no, because that's the, the Greeks' whole thing is they invented democracy. That's like oh, that's all they have is like Spanakopita and well, democracy. Yeah, I once people start talking about Spanakopita, I I tune out the rest of what they're saying. That's all I need. <laughs> right. You're like, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm, I'm like, not pleased to for Spanakopita. Honey or whatever. <laughs> um, so okay, so you're saying that it's kind of like Instead of it being what I thought was, you know, there's no rhyme, it's lazy, there's no rhyme, you're saying that they've instead deconstructed the Greek and created their own while keeping it kind of anglicized. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying it's it's uh, double nuanced. I mean, we got a it's... ways to go with the greedyocracy. I'm just going to warn everyone right now, there's quite a ways to go still with greedyocracy. But first off, do you think that idiocracy is com- – is Inspired by greedyocracy, so the word greedyocracy starts and ends. Well, it doesn't and no, sorry, it does not. Absolutely, does not end here. But it does start <laughs> here. The the word greedyocracy did not seem to exist in uh, pop culture until pre pre decline times. Yeah, like the, this word starts here with Fat Mike. So, idiocracy, Mike Judge, that comes out in two thousand six. Is that 
reference of this, but it also seems like I'm looking at Wikipedia. That's idiocracy is a portment, portmanteau of ideo, ideology and kratos, Greek for power. So ideo, ideocracy. Okay, so that's so maybe oh, that's, that's krasi me. Krasi. Okay, okay, this is so good that we're learning all this Greek right now. Yeah, I know. Well, here's the thing, Sam. So democracy stands for people power. Right. That makes That's sense. That's fucking lame. That's so lame. Well, yeah. No wonder it doesn't work. Exactly. But but he's saying it's greed power. It almost would be better if he had said <laughs> what's greed gre- power. What's what's greed for money? That might have been better. Well, also <laughs> it, uh, money money power. Uh, the idea of having the EO Chrissy, because I guess this is the Chrissy, so it's actually like uh, greedy o power it would is be really crimata <laughs> crimata crisi. That would be if it was money power. I, I, your attempted uh, sort of Greek accent is it's probably very convincing. I imagine it's a lot like Sarah's convincing Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Greek. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope someone will get him to me. The Greek. How? Um, <laughs> that is honestly still a funny movie. How? How many people have conjugated? Like, I, how many other like democracy? Like, I, I, see, I dumb, see, why, see, see. There we go. Like, he's already working with the theme of dumb. Why didn't he say democracy? That's so <laughs> much better. Well, because sorry, democracy movie. I feel like that's someone who couldn't remember. Oh no, there is a movie called Democracy. Yes. Do you like oh Idiocracy? God, I think I hate it. First of all, I honestly have only ever seen Idiocracy like kind of in passing. It was on uh, this was one tour that I did where we had a like a, a sort of TV in the van, and I remember like the dudes that I were with, I was with, like loved Idiocracy and thought it was very funny and would watch it. And I didn't really think it was that funny, and so I like generally sort of ignored the movie. Looked, like, yeah. Re- through it. I like I l- obviously love Mike Judge. I'm a human being, but uh, I Idiocracy I think is the first movie I ever torrented. And I was like, I want my money back. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. But that would have been <laughs> pretty funny <laughs> at the time if I'd said that. Anyways, it starts here. My so I mean Fat Mike, Mike Judge, these people love to say ocracy. I wanted to really think about it in the context of this anti-imperialist anthem. And I thought, who's like a linguist that we could get on the pod to talk about this? And I, of course, I emailed uh, Noam Chomsky, who uh, has written back. <laughs> right. So yeah. I said, and I mean, it's true. He does. He literally does write everyone back, and he has written us back. So I said, hello, Dr. Chomsky. I'm writing with a strange <laughs> but possibly interesting media request. I'm the host of a punk rock themed podcast called 155. We we're doing an episode on No Effects' this song, The Decline which is a long rock opera about the decline, in quotes, of American society and the rise of fascism. I don't know if that's what it's about, really. I was just trying to do a quick Coles notes that might tickle his fancy. Um, yeah. In addition to its anti No, that's good. I can themes, see how you're really, like, Chomsky baiting here. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to get a chomp. <laughs> <laughs> it also features the sole use of a strange portmanteau in pop culture, greedyocracy. The lyrics for the song can be found here. I was wondering if you might have five or ten minutes to speak on the phone about this peculiar word and the lyrics in general. If that's not possible, would you care to comment here? Well, he did comment, and uh, Noam Chomsky said, Strange. Nothing of interest to say about it, I'm afraid. So thank you so much, uh, Noam Chomsky. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Noam Chomsky. Are we going to put featuring Noam Chomsky in this uh, <laughs> episode could. description? Because I, mean, I think it's accurate. <laughs> we could. We, I feel like we, we did have do featuring Scott Rayner when all we got was like him saying no, yes, no, no, yes uh, <laughs> to an email questionnaire. So that was honest as well. I think if we so, didn't, this would be also honest. If we didn't have featuring Godspeed You Black Emperor, I would consider it. But um, I don't know. I feel like saying featuring Godspeed You Black Emperor and Noam Chomsky is fairly <laughs> compelling. <laughs> <laughs> so the phrase is also peculiarly in another pop punk song. I don't think I've ever heard this band, but it, you oh. must have. But Star Fucking Hipsters. Is, oh, yeah. What's the deal with Why this? Why would I have heard this band, though? Isn't Star Fucking Hipsters like a, like a leftover crack thing? Are, oh, that's what they are. Yeah, okay. I always think that they're uh, 
For so, yeah, oh, we've talked about this before because they are yeah, we definitely have. I was they like, cross why, over why between leftover you? crack and sign and the ergs, and so I think of them as being like a fest T-shirt band as well. Oh, I think no, they they're are definitely not. They're, they're, I no. think I think people wear fest, t- and also like, is this sort of like a diss that, about a hip? Like, is this are they named after like that? Like people from the Cobra Snake era who like were just hipsters who fucked celebrities. <laughs> like, why is it called Star Fucking Hipsters? Look at I don't know. I look at I'll try to look that up. But you're right. I mean, I think it's just look, this is another band that Mike Yerg is in. Is this named after Plus Corey it. Kennedy, uh the infamous sort of scene star of the Cobra Snake era? Is that why it's called? Or like who's I'm trying to understand the hipsters who are fucking stars. That's kind of a great uh a great name. And maybe the new star fucking hipsters are like Machine Gun Kelly or Pete Davidson or something. I don't know. But anyways, in their song The Broken Branches, they do sing greediocracy. So let's listen to this. Natural disaster, a greedy little mouth to feed, a season to die faster, a reason for the earth to bleed, a regated up survival. Kind of cool intro. Confines the genealogy of a skull to fill the catacombs and hang down from the family tree. Like, I don't know if they're... So obviously this band is... Oh, go ahead. (laughs) Before we well, get I found an interview uh, with uh, um, Stizza from punknews.org. Um, the question is, uh, I'm confused how to parse the name star fucking hipsters. Is it star fucking, is it, sorry, is a star fucking hipster a hipster that has sex with famous people, or is it a famous hipster that uses the word fucking as an adjective? And the response is only, or it's a group of stars slash hipsters. It was meant to be ambiguous. No, it's not ambiguous. So at maybe all. they are the stars themselves. You know, because there's already that chill wave band called Starfucker, also. And I think that's just kind of a, it's a phrase. Being a Starfucker is a phrase. So Great that's, Nine Inch Nail song, too. I, doubt, I highly doubt that. Anyways, okay, we're about to get to the big greediocracy drop. By saying the lyrics, it seems like this band is <laughs> on Fat Wreck, but I also feel like they're somehow saying greediocracy in a way that doesn't feel like it's referencing the decline. It's so weird. <laughs> Does that feel like a... Well, no, it feels like they did it to rhyme with hypocrisy. How are they? How are people arriving at this new word? Well, I guess this is post... So this is 2011. Um, and you know it's after 9-11 because this album does have a song called 9-11 Till Infinity. So thankfully they've made it clear which side of the divide they're on. That's uh, the cool, Great that's, Time Divide. That's a cool reference. Very helpful. 93 Till Infinity. <laughs> Such a banger. Souls of Mischief. Um, Shout out. I I feel like because this is also post because when is idiocracy? Two thousand six. I feel like I feel like idiocracy more than anything opens up the floodgates of you know word that replaces democracy or demo. So you end up with again democracy, uh, which was a it's a book that. Uh, you know, some some guy wrote about the loony left and the rabid right, you know, uh, giving it to both sides equally. And so I feel like this is more everyone's kind of combining another word and, and ocracy, like stupid ocracy. You can just put anything. Yeah, there's in there. a song called Stupid Ocracy by a band called The Busters from there, an album called Waking the Dead, actually. Oh, wow. I'm trying to see if there's the, a the, the oh, busters. I searched diarrheocracy and there is a hashtag yeah. shitocracy on Twitter. Although yes. it says no results somehow, but it still Whoa. appeared in Google. That's interesting. What about what about just like poopocracy? We keep it keep it a little PG. Well, there's at least an urban urban uh, dictionary for poopocracy, a system of government that has devolved or gone to shit. Thanks. That I mean, seems like someone really just like trying to trying to make poopocracy happen. So that there is an urban dictionary. What about a loveocracy? Huh? How about that's that's some positive vibes, eh? Oh, there's an Instagram account called Loveocracy. Oh, there's a website uh, to buy products from influencers called Loveocracy. I think Wal- I think this is like a Walmart thing. 
But again, this all seems to be coming in the wake of, of, of idiocracy. Yeah, it's very interesting. So the so you mentioned Urban Ooh. Dictionary. The Urban Dictionary reference, the first Urban Dictionary definition of greedocracy. Uh, we'll get to the second in a second. But the first one, you know, it mentions no effects. It mentions star fucking hipsters. And it also mentions that in 2007, there was graffiti caught on photo, caught on photograph around Quebec City. Uh, of Ooh. Gridiocracy. So that's clearly the person who did it added that to there because they want us to uh, je me souviens their graffiti. Dude, I think. Je me souviens Gridiocracy. <laughs> also, de- Quebec City, basically a city of no effects fans. Yeah. So the, I guess that makes sense. And they're probably also like thought that if the government was engaging in Gridiocracy because they, they often are, these fucking oh, guys. I mean, the Quebec government is uh, they're just constantly. They love Gridiocracy. They do love Gridiocracy. But- but None you know who construction. So you know who else loves greedyocracy uh, is, uh, of course, the uh, well well known. I mean, two million followers on Twitter. The sort of I would say controversial Nigerian politician and former senator uh, Dino Mele. Um, he formerly represented the Koji West senatorial district, um, and he's mm. from Ijumu. So he's a Nigerian. A very controversial Nigerian uh, politician who seems to constantly be railing against the government, and he also has quite a robust uh, controversy and scandal section on his own Wikipedia. <laughs> Always it's the most entertaining v- part. Very long, but anyways, like I was googling the phrase, I didn't see the second Urban Dictionary reference. I didn't notice that till right now. But I, when I googled the phrase "greedocracy," a whole bunch of Nigerian news sources came up. And basically, every time this guy makes a speech, he accuses the Nigerian <laughs> government of greedocracy constantly. Yeah, he's constantly saying it. This guy, like, it's on his Twitter. Even he's multiple times he's tweeted uh, the phrase greedocracy. There's this. So he's saying, "What we have is not democracy, but greedocracy. Government of the greedy, by the greedy, and for the greedy." Uh, SDM, and then there's like a picture. He kind of has his own. Like, oh my quote god! Meme. This dude rocks. Does he rock? Wait, hold on. I, I mean, he probably. Yeah, they, thing. there's some things that definitely do not rock. It mostly looks like there. it's about banking. Yeah, the personal um, life thing is kind of. There's some sketchy stuff in there. Uh, I think regarding his divorce, it seems a little. Oh, uh, oh okay. Iffy. Well, I want to just say I didn't mean it when I said that he rocked. But in um, terms of his, uh, you know, his political rhetoric, he seems to have arrived at the phrase. Unless he was a big no effects fan, maybe he is, or he's arrived at it independently. I haven't been able to make that connection, but I mean, so do, yeah, does he have any tweets about no effects or the decline? I don't think so, but I like I have a few of his speeches uh, where he talks about greedocracy, and it's kind of like it's kind of mind blowing to be honest. Like he says it every single just time. To hear a politician, say. he just says it every single time. Like uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find it in the videos that have the clearest audio, but we might be able to make it out in here. This is. Uh, the video is entitled Nigeria Practices Greedocracy by Dino Mele. Um, Mr. President. He's really like animated when he, like he, he's always like yelling a lot. The new amendments. But I think I'm, when I told you, I told you earlier, I need a few more minutes cause I'm, I'm doing, I'm working on <laughs> this. I was trying to find the, the greedocracy. The, mo- the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I think you might be able to make it out in this video. Otherwise there's a few others, but the best one is on Facebook, and I can't put it in and watch together. So anyways, but all you need to know is that uh, Dino Mele constantly says greedocracy. Opening yourself to the people. Democracy will continue to be government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Never will we allow democracy to be government of the greedy, by the greedy, and for the greedy, thereby describing it as greedocracy. There you go. He said yeah. it. <laughs> he said it. So he said it. <laughs> I mean, this is not an endorsement. Uh, we don't. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't really read up enough on uh, his his platforms and the the situation uh, in the Nigerian Senate to know whether or not the pot officially endorses him or not. But this is more about the fact that he has made its way into his political rhetoric, uh, which I think is interesting. I think it's important, yeah. No one on the pod knows enough about Nigerian politics to endorse a politician, but we do endorse the usage of the term greedocracy. Yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of all I have to say about greedocracy, but I just, like, what a journey it's been, just thinking about that That's a beautiful journey. Well, you have had some other things to say about greedocracy on your... You mentioned sort of usage on Twitter, and in addition to you tweeting about the decline... um, (laughs) 
you know, previously, you have you have tweeted s- several times <laughs> about like you've actually tweeted. I think at least three times about the fact that we are living in a greedyocracy. Uh, <laughs> your first usage is uh, in in 2017 in in uh, in March uh, when you said no effects is right. We really are living in a greedyocracy. Uh, then uh, also in 2007, uh, but a few months later in August, um, I can't see you're tweeting at someone who who uh, is, is private or is blocked me perhaps it's kind of unlikely oh really we need um, someone to block sam so you can go on block party so let's get yeah that. like <laughs> no one's no one's interested uh where you have responded to whatever this person is posted with they truly are living in a greedyocracy uh <laughs> and then in, in 2019 in february so close to the same period of time in which you initially tweeted that we were living in a greedyocracy <laughs> you didn't even tweet about no effects you just tweeted we're living in a greedyocracy <laughs> Uh, and then, <laughs> and then in 2020, uh, in October of 2020, um, when I guess th- this was sort of already several years after people had been tweeting about how we were like, this is a real classic, like Josiah, like coming in sort of hot, making fun of people still making these references, um, an apt name for idiocracy would have been greedyocracy. <laughs> and that appears to be your most popular greedyocracy uh, tweet. You're, so. I, see, I thought everyone was kind of like in on how funny this was. I just searched just the word greedyocracy and it's just me. I didn't search people <laughs> I follow. I just searched the word. It's me, my brother Johnny, who was with me at, at Calvin College, <laughs> tweeting – uh, what lyrics make this happen with someone getting goosebumps? And he said, when Fat Mike sings the word greedyocracy. And then the rest <laughs> of it is just literally Nigerian politics, actually. Like, there's so many people. Talk- and then somebody else said that someone replied to Dino Mele and said, you're a greedyocracy chief. Don't act like a saint. And they tweeted a picture of the cars that he owns and said that he's being a greedyocracy chief. And then uh, someone else said that not only is it a greedyocracy, but also a wicked deocracy. So there's kind of like... Wow, it's well, wicked idiocracy. Yeah. Like it's the, <laughs> the power is all in the hands of the wicked. Yeah, it's so good. I mean, maybe I, I've been making fun of this my whole life, but maybe I actually just loved saying different things are different kinds of ocracy. I think it rocks. I'm also receipt. realizing that right, I think the, the only see. other <laughs> the only other people um, that aren't um, it appears to be Nigerian politicians are also then people who like follow the pod <laughs> like uh <laughs> at cheeks adams who who i've definitely seen before has just treated tweeted the word greedyocracy in august of this year like only that word wow amazing a chieftain of the greedyocracy group uh, yeah. so just, maybe maybe you missed your calling you actually would have been a great I could have been like a speech writer or something. I mean, he, he definitely, I think he definitely has his speeches on lock, but um, yeah, there's just like, there's so many articles from in, from Nigerian newspapers about (laughs) greedyocracy. Like he just, he loves to say, Oh, it's so good. And you really made this like his thing, eh? Yeah. Like constantly, constantly saying it. And and he always says government of the greedy, by the greedy and for the greedy. Um, Yeah. Opera. Oh, this so this one I, I was on earlier. This is from a website called Nigerian Opera News. Is the name of the uh, damn? Don't tell this, me the opera is a greedyocracy. Well, you know they just are quoting a lot more from <laughs> Dino. I mean, it's all of his memes, basically just calling it. Oh, and then they talk about his cars in here too. I mean, he's really. He, it's kind of like when Fat Mike showed off his punk vacation home, and you're like, mm, this has greedyocracy vibes to me too. You know, like, mm. but yeah, this, so this opera news piece is kind of an expose about the, the, uh, perhaps hypocritical greedyocracy of Dino. Um, but yeah, what a, what a cool word that is, the greedyocracy. Yeah. I wonder if we're, the pod is really going to pop in Nigeria now. Maybe, uh, it could, it could, ever since I changed my name to, um, just J O S. Uh, like on Twitter, because that kind of was what happened um, organically from Bill Billingsley calling me Joe's. I, I've actually been getting, to be honest with this isn't even, I just remembered this right now, but I have been getting a lot of followers and retweets from people who live in Joe's, Nigeria, uh, <laughs> aka oh, J Town. So J Town. Maybe this is, maybe it's all happening. 
Wow. Uh, I had no idea how accidentally Nigerian um, the pod was. Yeah, I know. And I feel like we should probably move on now. But um, what an interesting <laughs> – what an interesting – this kind of Anytime you want to move on from something that I'm still happy to talk about, I'm always like, "What? Whoa! What am I doing?" I mean, wrong? I better quickly <laughs> check the Joe's Nigeria page to see if there's any. No, there's no 155 on here, so uh, I don't know. But I've been like, <laughs> okay, I've, so- I've been like followed by like different restaurants and like tagged with promos and stuff for like really you know, sandwiches and yeah, like there was a while where I was so really think, popping like, off in really- Joe's Nigeria. <laughs> You feel like maybe uh, like would it be good for you to 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 move to to Joe's? Like could you could you benefit because I would you're getting love sandwich to. coupons or whatever? Let me just real quick check if Dino Malay has done anything in in Joe's. Uh, in Joe's, yeah, that would be. Imagine there's a speech where he talks about greedocracy in Joe's. Like oh, that would uh, be, okay, I found his LinkedIn and he actually went to the University of Joe's. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> yes. So he learned about greedocracy. At Joe's University. I'm connecting with him. What's the name of the university? Uh, I don't know. University of Joe's, I guess. Oh, my God. Okay. Do they have a sweater? This is the most important thing. <laughs> university of Joe's. Oh, Let's my God. Go. Yes. Is University of Joe's a good school? It is the second best school in Nigeria and the leading institution in ICT. I do not know what that is. Oh, the crest is so cool. Okay. Well, let's see. What are what are some of the famous uh, uh, notable alumni? Um, Dino. Let's see. These are mostly politicians uh, who I am not familiar with. Yeah, that, I think that's why. That's I think not surprising. We probably need to learn a little bit more about Nigerian politics to keep uh, talk to keep riffing on this much longer. Um, but, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah you're, you're, I, I can see why you want to move on because at some point you should just not be like riffing extensively about a country you're not familiar with. But the point is greedyocracy. The point is that we are everyone at some time or another feels like they're living in a greedyocracy. Um, I mean, we've only listened to a minute and 25 seconds of the song. Should we hit play a little bit more? I think we should hit play a little bit more. Yeah. Add the Bill of Rights, subtract the wrongs. Very funny. Very good. Also, also, I, I, I do think the getting getting a fear of God in there, which we, we heard a bit of right before we stopped to talk about greedyocracy, which I think we should acknowledge, it also feels very of this era. Like this is the like I feel like talking about God in America in the '90s into the 2000s. Like this is the dawn of kind of like atheist culture. You know, like as, right. a, as a real like cult like uh you know thing that you have to acknowledge that that does truly um un- unfortunately um exist when i feel like i can't remember how much god there is sort of coming in the song but i i do feel like that also portends many no effect songs about americans of god it's true that's very true and then add the bill of rights subtract the wrongs to me it makes me think of schoolhouse rock obviously the bill uh, maybe I'm just thinking of the Simpsons riffing on School of Rock, but add the Bill of Rights, subtract the wrongs. It's just that's just funny. That's funny wordplay. That is honestly just really funny. I can't believe how fucking funny Fat Mike is. And then the then like for a, a guy who feels like he should just be like he's this is, add the Bill of Rights, subtract the wrongs is so fucking clever. It's true. And then the there's no answers. There's no answer, that's yes. such a cool. Okay, that like jaunty Ben Fold style oh. part is so sick. But prior to that, <laughs> it really is. It's very whatever and ever. The 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 backing vocals are doing a, like there must be. They're pretending it's not musical theater, but obviously it is. Because to say there's no answers, memorize and sing Star Spangled songs when the questions, and then the main vocal starts riffing off of the back. Like it seemed like it was call and response or like unrelated, but then. The when the questions goes into aren't ever asked like that's that's some like clever weaving going on I think oh they yeah there's big time clever weaving happening in this the, the yeah the backing vocals being like an integral part of the of the narrative and not just you know mm-hmm. repeating a, a memorable phrase that feels very musical theater Is anybody oh, this part's so good. United, United stagnation. stagnation is like a riff on United Nations, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Let's see. Oh, this part's so cool. Oh, fuck me! Fucking so good! And then some more lamenting coming in here with these lyrics. Mother, what have I done? 
Okay, we should talk about because I feel like that's also the first time that you get a hint of like the the sort of how inventive the production is in really subtle ways that like build there where it, it's uh it goes very like i don't know what is that all mids or like tape sounding I, i've already forgotten and i've moved past it but there's this like very subtle small way that the song sort of like just sounds a little bit different before you get into the like what is effectively like the first big melodic shift in the song like this introduction of the new uh-huh. um of this new melody right it's but I want to look up United Stagnation. Is that something that, you know? <laughs> yeah, I wonder. That, I mean. <laughs> the, the United Stagnation seems like something that could be, A, either related to, like, college sports or something, like some American shit oh, that we wouldn't yeah. understand, where it's like, oh, yeah, the Austin Stags, you know? We're the United Stagnation. Or the Stag Shop, which at the very least in Canada, I think is, like, the most popular adult store like as a as a franchise right i don't know i don't know if that's canadian or that's an international thing but it also seems like it could be an ad for like the dildo store Mm -hmm. like we you know we're part of the united stagnation we've got dildos i do see here there is a french um there is a french punk band called united stagnation yeah i just found them so you know in the spirit of je me souviens we should probably check that out um but I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what's crazy is you're right. Like there are no tweets about greedyocracy except for you and your brother and and Nigerian politicians. But there are so many tweets about United Stagnation. Like people love tweeting. Yeah. What? Like how did everyone, United Stagnation? Did people just? Am I insane? Did people just think that that was a normal thing to say? Was. Uh, Greedyocracy? It's so weird to me. Every like so many United Stagnation, and it's all this is so weird. Yeah. Okay. Let's check out uh, United United Stagnation symbol for everyone. This is the French uh, punk band. This is pretty good. It sounds about right. Whoa, kind of got dark there for a second. I love these kind of like, these kind of like professionally shot videos for a band that you've never heard of where it seems like they might have rented out a full auditorium to shoot this. It's like I empty. shoot this, yeah. Like, <laughs> the bass player is eternally goofy. <laughs> yeah. This is sick. United Stagnation is cool. Yeah, this fucking rocks. I think there are people in this audience. <laughs> oh, yeah, there are. Cool. Yeah. United, United Stagnation is popular. Well, are they on, uh, they on Twitter? Let's see. No. No, I don't think they exist anymore. Um, okay, but we should keep going because we... We're, Symbol we're... for everyone. Oh. Such beautiful, like the chord progressions that just run up and down scales. It sounds so good. Yeah. And then this part, this next part. Oh my god! Oh. The was. Insane. Oh, okay, yeah, like that is because I feel like we got to. There's so many moments of just like constant escalation in the song. So when you get to that, what have I done? You're like, fuck, and then down, but like brings it down, but in such a like propulsive fucking way. And the thing that's like coming is is truly, I think for me, like the. I mean, the woes are great. Everything about the song is great, but like when it fucking comes back up after this, it's just like dumb. The song should be illegal. It's ridiculous. It's uh, and I think people, some people have said they've never listened to it. Some people have said it's like one of their least favorite no effects things. I, I really do think this is like obscene. transcendent. Um, there, there's something I just noticed. There's a car cast of my second kill. I, I never really understood what those lyrics were. I thought he was talking about a car, um, but that's just funny how he well, yeah, I don't he think separates I syllables to make them work for him. But like sometimes it feels awkward. I think some of the rhyme schemes in. Um, we threw gasoline on the fire, like felt kind of awkward, but in here, everything feels so intentional and earned. Like I love that he did that with the word carcass. It's so weird. And so 
here's where, I, and I've never really looked into this or thought about it. He's saying there's down by the park, under stone, under pine. Again, beautiful, poetic Gorgeous. description. Um, there's a carcass of my brother, William. Like, is this where it gets like conceptual? It's something about actually killing. A, <sighs> there's a character named William who gets killed. Yeah, I don't think I, I ever realized that there was like a name in the song. I think before we get hold on, because I want to go in order here for a second. So just park that real quick, because in the annotation for Father, what have I done? I took that twenty two a gift for me to you uh, to bed with me each night. Uh, the, the genius annotation is: in certain parts of America, guns aren't associated with crime at all. In rural areas where hunting is common, guns are associated <laughs> with family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh you. my god and then the reply says to go deeper into the last three lines keep kept it clean polish it while cherish every cartridge every shell this resembles the rifleman's creed <laughs> Never heard of this. which i didn't know i'll be honest i only know this as um like the i only know the clown's full prayer. metal jacket oh right of, of course <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never seen that rifle there are, yo, I mean, it fucking rocks yeah well let's check uh, it out let's check out the rifleman's creed maybe we'll hear some <laughs> Oh, great. Okay, this is good. Rather than me reading it. Great, we'll get... Uh, the Rifleman's Creed. Really fun to say. Hopefully we get some real noted rifle. noted great tweet of Vincent Dinocchio like on this. But this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. Before God, I swear this creed. My rifle and myself are defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until there is no enemy. But peace. Amen. I didn't really catch much uh, no effects in there, but that was sick. It's, I mean, quite sick. Um, <laughs> I honestly thought that that was just like some wacky shit, you know, to just demonstrate how. Yeah, how much he loves his how gun. How much Kubrick hates hates the military. But I didn't realize that was a real thing that they actually make. Yeah, the Rifleman's Creed. People say so <laughs> when cool. they join the army. This is making me second guess my opinion on troops. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little worried about that. Um, so that's great. And then, okay, so so then you wanted to get into the conceptual part because so so we get from we go from Vincent D'Onofrio into, I mean, even this, the carcass, the Rifleman's Creed section William. opens with "Father, what have I done?" And so he's talking about how much he loved his gun and respected it. But then, down by the creek, under brush, under dirt, there's a carcass of my second kill. Down by the park, under stone, under pine, there's a carcass of my brother William. That's fucked. That's just like gives me sh- chills. How good that is. So fucking. It's so good. So he, holy fuck. I didn't know. I never thought about that before. But so I think he's like confessing that he killed his brother with his gun. What a dick. What a dick. <laughs> Incredible bass playing at this part. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. So, yeah, he confesses to killing his... We don't know why, but he kills his brother. Uh, it seems like it was maybe a hunting accident or just a mistaken shot because he he was supposed to squeeze the trigger rather than pull it, maybe, and he shot out of... Con- he missed his target? I don't I'm know. Not, I remember that from, like, the... the uh, I've been to a, a shooting range twice, and they do tell him, like, I've obviously never shot a gun otherwise. And yeah, that's funny because when, you're they, the more when someone tells you that, they're like, no, the you don't really way. squeeze so much as you pull. And I was like, yo, it's just like the song. It's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> and um, I also killed my brother William at the shooting range. In I Las was Vegas. wondering what happened to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We don't talk about don't talk about Bill Sutherland too much. <laughs> um, yeah, isn't it? Isn't uh, William? 
what's the name of the guy it's who had the, ap- the apple on his head? That's William Tell, right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So is it re- is, is it referencing that folklore legend, perhaps? Oh shit. Maybe it's his maybe he got his brother to put an apple on his head and then accidentally shot him. Is that and is that what the William Tell overture is about, or is that by William Tell? <laughs> uh, the William Tell overture is by Rossini. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh there is I mean it's a reference. Is- yeah, it's reference to the folklore. I think the song is about the folklore legend. So kind of I think this fight, Fat Michael's Tell overture, aka the decline, is kind of our modern version of that uh, William Tell overture. Wow. Which ones is it William Tell overture? Is that uh well, oh, know. this is the, the the Lone Ranger song. Okay, so it's just da 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 da, da, da right? That's it. Well, Sam, I mean, that's the big we, hook. We got time. We got time. Let's hear it. Yeah, we should. Li- let's listen to the William Tell overture here. Let's understand We're all having... the references. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's the, this is the Looney Tunes song. <laughs> oh, so sick. Imagine writing like a transcendent piece of classical music like this. You know what I mean? This like the decline. beautiful, this is an opera or whatever, the decline. I mean, and, dude, and just Even the way that and, all these horns are riffing on each other, it feels like the, de- the decline feels like this. Yeah, truly. <laughs> just, just the idea that you could create something so like this transcends time, this will always be like a piece of music that everyone, like it's just sort of sewn into the fabric of culture, but exclusively in scenarios <laughs> where cartoon characters are chasing each other. Yeah, it's like the silliest possible <laughs> circuit. Although I feel like the original story of, a, I don't know the details, but a guy with an apple on his head getting shot at is pretty silly to begin with. Like that's pretty wacky. Totally. So. Also realizing this is maybe like, okay, so there's definitely references to Rossini here and, and the sort of legend of William Tell. But also now, there, I mean, I feel like definitively what we're saying is that there are two Kubrick references because we already have the Rifleman's Lament or, or whatever from Full Metal <laughs> the Jacket. The Rifleman's Creed. Rifleman's Creed, but real? also... Of course, the William Tell Overture uh, is is featured um, in the orgy in Clockwork Orange, um, oh an electronic rearrangement uh, by Wendy, Wendy Carlos. Um, it's also used in the Princess Diaries. But I would say, so this song is referencing uh, Italian opera. Uh, so far, two Kubricks in here is what you're it's, saying. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we can agree this is Kubrickian. I bet they had to do a lot well, of here's takes. The, here's the thing. Like, we're kind of half joking, and I think that we are, uh, you know, obviously reaching a little bit but at the same time i think when a work of art is as dense as the decline is it does Mm -hmm. tap into some grander tradition of artistry where i would say that whether it was intentional or not for them to reference kubrick twice in the same passage it is i still believe that it is two kubrick references because uh it is just such a it's part of such a larger tradition of sort of uh, challenging art so respect yeah, absolutely. And in the same way that I think here's a song from a band that is known for being like jokey and dumb, the way that the William Tell Overture is now associated with being joking and dumb, but is in fact like, you know, an astonishingly complex uh, and, and instantly classic uh, musical work. And so, again, yeah, we are we are sort of half joking, but all jokes aside, when you do something that is this uh, interesting, there are going to be intentional or not allusions to other pieces of culture. Like Brother William, I mean, come on, Brother William. Is there like a famous <laughs> monk or anything? What's what you Google Brother? Who's Brother William? You know? Yeah. Well, I think. Who, it's, what do you? What do you? What when you call people brother or something like? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Harry. Oh yeah, it's Prince William. The, I guess they're saying the royal family could be. Um, yeah. What I want to know William is William of uh, oh oh William of Bakersville was known as Brother William, uh, and he's uh, a fictional. Franciscan Friar from the 1980 historical novel *The Name of the Rose* by Umberto Eco. <laughs> there we go. Well, that's that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he means when he says "a kill is what you want, a kill is why we breed"? Is it just kind of like humanity's need to uh, kidnap and kill other things? Like it's just kind of the the lethal desires of humanity. Yeah, that to me feels like a little greedyocracy where you're just like Americans only exist to kill. And we don't even like, you know, we're not even 
fucking to, you know, help till the fields or continue our, our bloodline or our family. It's, it's, we're, we're doing it to create uh, another generation of killers. That's, that is, that is the essence of, of the American experience and identity. So, so just, to me, it just feels like a, such a condemnation of, of, uh, breeding. <laughs> And of course, that section ends with a, some huge hits again, and then we get to hear massive, Fuck. incredible. The guitar harmony there too. Oh. oh, there haven't been a lot of harms, and this is where the harms start showing up. The hits kind of changed there too, in a in, a, mm-hmm. in an amazing That's way. That's where it's good to point because then people know. I'm kind of confused by. I, I, sorry, I'll say this. At the time, I was really confused by the lyrics because I was at sort of a very heady uh, religious studies institution in Michigan where I was hearing this for the first time. Again, this is where Paul Schrader was educated, and I mean, he's. I think he still stands to argue that his films all have like, if not Christian, like religious themes. Like Paul Schrader himself uh, wrote a very famous text called um, Taxi Driver. It's called Taxi Driver. No, he he wrote a book in 1972. He published Transcendent- Transcendental Style in Film, which is kind of like about spirituality and filmmaking. So we're like in a place where it's like some highbrow uh, religious studies shit. And I, like my understanding, my upbringing, I guess, is to say, like, I was always surrounded by a very anti-war kind of Christian people. It wasn't until Mm. Trump that I understood that like American Christianity is fucking insane. I mean, there's problems everywhere, but it's like, I didn't realize how much pro-war, uh, is part of this was like the era. Okay. So you were, you were, you were living in some sort of shroud. Cause this is, this is all very like, I mean, I guess it's like pre. Well, I was like a child, but, also, so I didn't really. Yeah, I wasn't but, like watching but the, the whole George, George Bush presidency, which starts when? Two oh, two thousand and one. So wait, who's president at this time? Yeah, I like that's the thing. Was this George who, who Bush was the senior? Oh, Clinton? You're right. Oh, so Clinton. The idea yeah. Of the, like now, obviously, you did have like the Christian right and stuff, but I feel like that was the sort of the Christian right is like what propelled George Bush to the presidency, but that's like a few years later. So I can understand you having a rose colored view of your people. And how ironic is it that fat Mike wrote this sort of during Clinton and then later on was like, so unbearably with her, uh, in the Hillary era. That's kind of interesting. But anyways, so I was confused by the Christians love their guns. Um, and then somebody has annotated, despite following a religion that preaches peace and turning the other cheek, Christians have far higher rates of gun ownership than atheists and other religious groups. The legal gun owners usually aren't the ones responsible for street crime. <laughs> that, that has four proposed edits and one downvote. And somebody said, the last sentence is totally irrelevant. This sounds like it was posted by someone with a bias for gun ownership in Christianity. This is not a forum for you to come defend your love of violence. We're here to discuss these song lyrics. The, that final sentence has nothing to do with the lyrics. So, and that's the other thing is I, this is like a controversy. This just keeps going. The le- for another user, the legality of gun ownership, gun ownership or crime in general isn't referenced in this lyric. <laughs> And then somebody else, binary Brandon, the last line. <laughs> Let's go, <Oof>. Brandon. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <But> the, <laughs> so the, the Christians love their gods, the church and NRA, pray for their salvations, pray on the lower face. I mean, again, you know. Ooh, pray, pray. That is some sick wordplay, bro. That's so good. But I was thinking a lot about how it seems like, especially in the 90s, so many pop punk people skewed libertarian. And so it's interesting because I bet you there are a lot of like pro gun no effects fans as well. There has to be. There's just oh, so yeah. many no effects fans to begin with that it's kind of I don't know. But um yeah, this part's so sick and with the uh with the bass too, it's incredible. Yeah. I w- I also think the phrase lower fates is like is that a thing people say or is that like a because it's so fucking rude. Yeah, it's really weird. 
Christians often feel like they're entitled to more civil liberties than religious minorities, specifically Muslims, is what one contributor said about that. But yeah, that does seem like a... But is it prey on... Is it a reference to like um, Darwinism or something or like the food chain as well? Like it's preying on the lower thing? Well, no, it? it looks like... I mean, you, you actually can see like just Googling it and you get like Google book results. Um it seems like this is the this is a way that that sort of people who believe in the supremacy of their religion write about other religions. Like this is a book about aspects of Hindu morality from 1989. Um, why do we need to preserve the lower faiths in the face of the higher one? And if the lower faiths are not to be condemned or destroyed, should something or else? Uh, here's a book about uh, whatever the I think this is about Christianity from the Journal of the Transaction of the Victoria Institute. I just imagine that's probably pretty fucking Christian. Whatever the importance of the lower faiths of man and their interest to anthropologists, the gulf that separates them from Christian theism is deep and something else. So uh, uh, lower faiths is evidently a not necessarily commonly used phrase because, you know, most of the results are for an artist by Anne, who just a mononym Anne, who also has an album called Dream Punks with an X. Anne rocks Whoa. for sure. Shout out. Anne. Wait, so uh, Anne has a song called Lower Faiths? Yeah, should we listen to Anne's yeah, Lower Faiths? Yeah, absolutely, we should. Especially, I don't know if, if, if Lower Faiths is from Dream Punks, but. <laughs> I mean, uh, that really makes it count as a punk song. If it, Well, you know, that, she's still a punk artist. She's a dream punk. So it's. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is, this was, uh, this was put out by, um, What's it called? Uh, A three eighty nine. So confirmed punk. All right, let's check. Let's check out Anne's lower face. doesn't sound much like chokehold no from portland oregon and and it's and <laughs> so this is a band who chose to name themselves and their website has been hacked there's a blood letter or something you know yeah, oh, for sure. This is this is definitely like a gate creeper side project. I mean, this is cool. Yeah, it's not bad. I've, I mean, I feel like every every band that isn't straight up post punk sounds like this in the last ten years, but that's okay. Good for them. So after the prey on the Lord Faith's part, something happens, and I don't know because I'm I'm not playing it on guitar. I can't think of what's happening, but it feels like the chord progression goes up a step on the scale. Like something happens that it feels like it's propelling upwards a little bit. Cause it, mm -hmm. here we go. Maybe it's his vocal melody goes higher or maybe it's yeah. just in my head. Oh, and then this part straight up, that bass tone is like straight up some Brian, you know, YouTube production, like, the, the, free, yeah, sure. the free iPhone album. But you're I like, also did not realize that it was logic is long. Oh, you got to pause it here. Yeah, we I did not realize it was uh, log logic is a threat. Reason searched and seized. I thought it was we've been searched and seized. Right. So the storybook's been read and every line believed. Curriculum's been set. Logic is a threat. Reason searched and sees. This is a real, like, uh, if we didn't ultimately know where this band was coming from, I mean, Reason Magazine, of course, uh, that that sort of holiest of publications for the for the pop-punk libertarian set. Um, <laughs> right. That is also, and that whole, like, the way that that sounds, too, with the, like, just the bass kind of vibing through the guitar hits, like, oh, oh yeah, it's right? so Adam Clayton. And it's like, but it's like, I think even then, because I was surrounded by so much U2, as you could imagine at the time, I was like, oh, this is kind of sounding a bit gross. It also sounds like kind of like a Sting solo album. Like, it's a little bit adult contempo in a way that I love now, but at the time I wasn't super down with. But then, of course. Yeah. I mean, you know what happens next. I do. Oh! <laughs> Again, like, tragedy. <laughs> um, 
I think we leave it there for today because that's that's the first quarter, and I feel like we've covered a lot. But before we go, I mean, how are you feeling with the first quarter of uh, the decline? Look at it's one of those things where I get so stoked thinking about what is to come. I think we I think we cut off at the right point. First quarter, I mean, it's hard to imagine that the song could get better. But I think it does. And yeah. that is shocking to me. And already I'm like, oh, this is, this is like sort of our version of doing like a real, you know, like music podcast where it's like, you know, we're, we're isolating the, the, the <laughs> drum track so you can hear, you know, exactly how the kick drum pattern is designed to sort of mimic and build upon, you know, that most memorable of kick drum patterns from uh, Prince's uh, Raspberry Beret, you know? <laughs> like, it makes me feel like we're doing, same as when we did the Comeback Kid episode, I was like, oh, this is like a real, like, you know, um, what's, what's a, you know... Uh, like uh, uh, song time or whatever. Song. Yeah, <laughs> like, I literally the can't song remember, man. Yeah, yeah, like, pop, 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 the pop guys, you know? <laughs> and so I feel like uh, it's it's really fun to do this for a song that I love this much. I can't imagine doing this for, like, yeah, 99 some, like, dumb percent of the shit that we talk about. We yeah, should just but, do this. But, what when, if we just did this for a full year? I'll just keep going through it over and over again. I mean, that'd be fine. I think it'd be like that Grown Ups podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look at the decline rocks, decline December, because uh, I love branding rocks. And, uh, you know, logic is a threat, but we're going to be uh, endangering ourselves to bring that to you all through the month. So uh, I want to close out before we introduce the guests. Uh, there's something we have to talk about. But first, I do want to mm-hmm. first I do want to. How do you feel? How do you feel? I mean, this First was, quarter. This actually exceeded my expectations for how fun this is it was. a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's like really good. Uh, I feel great about it. I cannot wait. I'm going to be looking forward to every week's decline episode. But also, if you've somehow listened this far and you don't want to hear us talk about the decline, I don't think we're going to talk about the decline on Patreon this month. We'll do some fun stuff, but I don't know what it'll be yet. But yeah. So if you, if I think we're going to do, get our, get our decline out pretty thoroughly. Yeah. In the main feed. Maybe we'll try to incline on the uh, Patreon <laughs> instead. But yeah. so at patreon.com slash one five five pod, I mean it's gonna be it's always fun back there too. We let our hair down. If you thought that we seemed a little bit stuffy this week, you know, and which we did, I think. Yeah. It's kind of I think so. Yeah, because this was like a very academic episode. Yeah. So you could go we there. We learned about Greek. But the other thing I want to do real quick is each each decline episode I do want to highlight kind of a notable cover of the decline. And of course we gotta start with the most incredible Baz and his orchestra cover of The Decline. Obviously, we won't listen to the whole thing, but um, of course, Baz and his orchestra went on to perform the song with no effects, which maybe we'll talk about on another day. But just on its own, it is an impeccable piece of music. Um, well, in the video of no effects doing, it's like a live at Red Rocks thing, I think. It's like a full, you know, like beautifully shot at a, one of the most beautiful sort of venues i guess in america with the orchestra is is fucking incredible i will say i really do hate gopro uh pov cam it, I, th- I thought i'd be used to it by now but i just feel nauseous whenever it goes to that well i just don't know that i need it on the torso of a conductor like, yeah I'm, I'm not saying, don't make me feel like i'm conducting i'm not do your job I, don't make me do it yeah like, I, it's one thing to have a GoPro on, you know, the helmet of someone who's, you know, doing some sort of reckless extreme sport. But I've never thought of conducting an orchestra as something that I, you know, oh, what would it be like? Hold, hold up. Do you think that guy knows what they yell at that part and he yells it? Oh, my God. You're right. Yeah. One of the percussionists yelled. Okay, let's hear Fuck me? What did it say? Fall back? Go back again. Slow down. Oh my god, it sounds so good. Yeah, this fucking rocks. Okay, Fall go. back. I'm gonna take a little while to get to it and slow <laughs> down. I'll speed it up while we. Eat. I don't know if the other music podcasts are like this, are they? No, this is better. Okay, here it's coming up. Fuck me. No, thank you. 
You don't know. Whoa. Maybe you do. I mean, this is just incredible. It's so good. Like, I hate to say this, but this, this to me is a, is a little bit of like, as much as they are one of the greats, like a little bit like Green Day could never, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think that ultimately American Idiot stands up to this sort of like... No, American Idiot does feel like a kind of schmaltzy Broadway opera, whereas The Klein feels like a composition for real. Yeah, Absolutely. And all the, like, big, long Green Day songs really are just, like, four songs mashed together. Oh, this is so fucking good. I like that they're all wearing, like, sort of proper, you know, I'm performing in an orchestra outfits, except for the fuck me percussionist who has, like, a loose tie on. Like, he fully looks like he's ready to join the cast of Broadway Idiot at any moment. <laughs> Oh, so good. So uh, before we get to the guest this week, there's kind of something pretty heavy that we need to talk about. Um, someone who was a huge part of the Blink-155 and 155 Nation, um, Blair, I actually think I'm, I'm piecing it together and I feel like a significant portion of cool people in Canada listen to the pod or are excited about the pod, possibly because of Blair. I mean, Blair was kind of a person who uh, contributed all kinds of things to the pod. They did a cover of Hinder for the compilation. Um, They did, like, they were a member of Gullet, who did some covers for this iteration of the pod. And they, I I think they might have been on Free Punk Legs. I know it's like Blair had tons of musical output um, across over the years, the band Doggo was incredible. Um, you know, there's all kinds of sick Blair projects. Maybe I can link some band camps in this. But um, unfortunately, last week, uh, Blair passed away. And that's already so devastating and really upsetting. And I know a lot of people are really hurting from it. And even just the few interactions I had with Blair, it's, it's very, very sad. But then the extra strange layer is that... Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've always wanted to talk to Godspeed about the decline. And Blair was one of those few people who like fully understood, like fully got all, all angles of it. Because um, as you, as some of you know, and probably. And there are a lot of angles. There's a lot of <laughs> angles to get. As some of you know, yeah. I, uh, for our friend Hal Dottie's podcast, where you write a parody song in like half an hour. I did the most ill-informed and embarrassing cover of Uptown Funk by Bruno Mars and Mark Ronson, where all the lyrics were about the new Godspeed album dropping. And it's like the mo- easily the most embarrassing thing I've ever done to the point. I think it's really funny, but it's just like so. It's a remarkable work. It's like, it's like like the decline. It is a work. It's very cringy. And I was like, oh, this is fine. It's just for Hal Dottie's Patreon. But then, of course, uh, he decided to unlock the bonus episode and give it to everyone. And so... Uh, Little did I know that Blair actually sent it to Amara, who we're about to hear from, and also who ended up sending it to Ephraim and the whole band. And I mean, Mara was very kind about it in our interview, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've seen the real reactions through Blair. It's very funny. <laughs> but anyway, so like Blair just understood that it was so funny to send Godspeed my horrible Bruno Mars uh, parody. And Blair really just got the pod and got the jokes and like was one of the first people to get a blink 155 stick and poke. And they were just like, by all accounts, like a, a sweet, wonderful, kind and hilarious and very talented person. And so we're going to miss Blair a lot. And, um, thank you to Blair, you know, for everything you've done and specifically thank you this week. I mean, this week for setting up this interview with Godspeed. This week and this episode and this thing that you've been trying to do forever is amazing. And, you know, that Montreal show that we did in the Blink-55 days was easily one of the highlights of, like, doing this podcast. And, and, you know, and they were there. There's that that amazing photo of us and, like, all all of your friends now, you know, (laughs) in front 
in front of the bar and, 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 you know, I remember being just amazed. I was like, wow, one of these cool people listen to you and I talk about pop punk. And they were obviously such a huge part of that. And a lot of those people and people that we know and people that we've, we've come to care about are, are, are hurting. And that is, uh, shit but this being this episode and all of those things coming full circle is kind of i don't know speaks speaks to the the power that that they had yeah. inside of this podcast and, and what they did for us what they did for other people too totally yeah so i mean uh yeah now you get to hear because of truly because of blair i mean um who just kept harassing Maro to listen to the decline and talk to me <laughs> because they yeah. just got it so that's what we're about to hear and uh yeah like this this episode is dedicated to Blair, and I think maybe the whole month yeah. the whole month is dedicated to Blair. So um, thanks yeah. again, and here's Godspeed talking about the decline. I am very excited to have on one fifty five. This is just kind of a sort of a bucket list get. I cannot believe we have a member of Godspeed You Black Emperor, a founding member, Mauro Pazenti. What is up? Thank you for being here today. No problem. Um, I mean, how did you, how did you end up getting roped into doing this, uh, pop punk podcast? Um, well, I think it was a mutual friend of ours, right? Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was Blair who I think is yeah. constantly, uh, t- I think did Blair also text you a, uh, Godspeed you black emperor, Mark Ronson parody song that somebody made a few weeks ago. Yes, ago? he did. I didn't know that that was also connected to this as well, but yeah, you <laughs> sent that to me as well. And, uh, uh, I have a little baby now, so I don't really work much and I don't do much other than hang out with little baby. So whenever I get these kinds of opportunities, they're kind of fun. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not much different from a little baby, so I think it makes sense. To be here, you'd, you'd be surprised at how different the little babies are. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I I'm embarrassed to admit that the, that uh, that incredibly goofy uh, Mark Ronson song and that was made by me <laughs> for my friend's podcast. So cool. it was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess before we talk about the subject at hand, I'd love to know, kind of like going way back in time, how did you first? become aware of like underground music um well i grew up in the 80s and 90s so the 80s and 90s were a lot different than nowadays of course um i don't want to sound like an old man even though i am an old man but (laughs) i do feel like it was a lot different then than it is now in the sense that uh a lot of underground music uh I mean, I don't want to call it underground, but or whatever. Well, let's call it underground. Um, was uh, you know, like we we weren't uh, we were punk rockers, and we didn't see ourselves connected to the mainstream world. So, anything that was outside of the mainstream world was uh, exciting for me and interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, it started changing, of course, around the early '90s when. Uh, grunge became what it became and uh i found that at that point there a lot of alternative stuff or underground stuff started becoming more mainstream or not necessarily mainstream like beyonce but you know like more popular to the general public and it started getting to be a little frustrating and annoying to me at least thinking that all of these things that I thought were cool and were for us all of a sudden turned into uh, things that, uh, you know, jocks and bros down the street were getting into and it wasn't really that exciting anymore. So, but, you know, of course uh, I'm an older man now and uh, there's probably things that are underground now that I had no idea what they are. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I mean, I remember when I was a teenager being obsessed with Godspeed uh, I'm still a huge fan, and I'm, I want to ask you a little bit about Godspeed in a second. But I remember there being like in interviews, the the rare interviews would often be very kind of like. I feel like I remember there was like something about <clears throat> maybe not to name names, but like Radiohead or something. Like it was kind of like there was the, there was this kind of us versus them mentality that you really truly don't see anymore in culture. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm an older man, so I don't really know for sure. I'm pretty sure there are some people who still have that mentality, but for me, it really did start 
to be that way. It was really me against them. And it's, and it, I mean, I know that there's definitely people in my age group that still feel that way. Um, and I, again, I'm going to sound like an old man, but I feel like nowadays it's less and less important about us versus them, even though there's all this talk about younger people and maybe it's going to change now. And with younger people being interested in climate change and all of that, uh, environmental and ecological destruction um, that is becoming more hopefully us versus them attitude. Mm -hmm. But I felt like there was a period of time where it was just about becoming famous and popular and uh, becoming well-known. And and for me, it was never ever about that. It was about, you know, actually the the, quite the opposite of not being famous and not being well-known and just having fun and, uh, we uh, as a band became very uh, lucky that we became very popular and it's it's been incredible in in a way um i can pay my bills now very well and very easily um i can still walk down the street and nobody even knows who i am but uh <laughs> i do play in the dark so no one can see me anyways but right. uh it, it never was about becoming famous and i felt like now or there was a moment in time about maybe 15 years ago in Montreal where all of a sudden all these bands all just came to Montreal and they thought that they were just all going to become rock stars and it became very annoying. Right. It's, I, I've always found it's annoying, A, when people have that mentality, but B, when it actually works. It's even more frustrating. Yeah, and it did work for quite a lot of people in Montreal and, uh, you know, early to uh, whatever, uh, early 2000s, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said that, you know, when you were younger, you, you, you thought of yourselves as punk rockers and I, I love that. And I'm curious about like, you know, what that meant to you, what that means to you. Did you ever like, were you ever like into like skate punk or anything or, or was it just kind of more ideologically you felt like a punk rocker? (laughs) First of all, we never walked around saying I'm a punk rocker. Right. (laughs) Right. But I mean, looking back at myself as a teenager, uh, I, I understood, understand now what I was feeling like when I was a teenager. Uh, of course, when you're a teenager, you don't really understand who you are or what the fuck's going on in the world. Um, and as you get older, you realize, oh, right, that's why I felt that way. But um, I was born in 1971, so I was 18 in the late, eight, uh, whatever, 89. So I was listening to a lot of Husker Du and uh, all that kind of rock and roll music from the late 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was more of an attitude for sure. It was, it was not, and, I, and like I said, I never walked around saying, I'm a punk rocker, I'm a punk rocker. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, it was definitely a, a feeling, like we've already said, of us versus them. Uh huh. And so what about like when you were a teenager, were you going to shows in Montreal? Uh, I grew up in Toronto and I came to Montreal in 2000 or not in 2000 in uh, 90, uh, was it 92? So I, yeah, I grew up in Toronto, uh, tried to watch as many shows as I could when I was 17 and 18. Uh, the drinking age was 19 in Toronto, so I couldn't see a lot of the bands that I wanted to see. And strangely enough, most of the bands that I really liked stopped becoming bands soon after I became 19. So I didn't actually get to see them. Most like, of them. Uh, like, like what bands was it? <laughs> well, Husker Du would be like one of the, the main ones. They're, they're, they're the band that, that really, they're still my most favorite band of all time. And I still listen to them nowadays and I still like their music and it still hasn't changed for me, but they're, they're like the one band that would have been like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess Nirvana would be another band, but I mean, I, I kind of, as soon as Nirvana got really huge, I started kind of didn't want to hear them anymore. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's painting a picture for me. So, and then you moved to Montreal and then, I mean, how did you go from that to starting Godspeed You Black Emperor? Well, again, as I said, 
in the early 90s and as the most people know grunge became what it what it became and i was you know of that generation listening to all of the grunge bands um but as soon as it became huge the last thing i wanted to do was to play grunge music and Ephraim and i uh, with a friend of ours mark had started a, a three-piece uh, basically grunge band in the early 90s and um, we played a couple of shows and then after that we stopped and we got really depressed and we didn't really feel like wanting to play music anymore um, because of uh, what grunge had become and what you know for us was rock and roll music had become uh, and when we started jamming again together we kind of had this idea of, you know, let's do the complete opposite. Let's not have three minute long pop songs. Let's just play long extended drony music. And, um, we were probably definitely influenced by Sonic Youth a lot back then, or at least I was. Mm -hmm. And not that they were playing 15 minute long songs, but the idea of, uh, alternate tunings became very exciting to me. And again, it was this thing where it's, uh, you know, like I don't need to play regular tuning. I'm going to play my own tuning. I'm going to make it up. And that was more exciting for me than to play regular tuning. And um, yeah, so that's basically what happened. We, uh, from Mike and I just started jamming and uh, we just didn't want to be a grunge band. So that was the basic beginning of it. I love that. I love that it's just kind of, it started as kind of a reactionary move because you were sick of what you were seeing. Yeah. And also, it also wasn't something like, again, where we were like, you know, broadcasting out to the world where it's like, we're starting a band and we're not going to be like any other band. It wasn't like that. It was <laughs> right. like, you know, let's just, let's just have fun and let's jam. And, and we, we would, play at this at this uh um community center uh, on saint catherine's that we got access to through a friend of ours and you know it just kind of happened naturally and and that was the whole thing i like about us and uh my band is that we never really planned anything we just kind of let things happen on their own and it mm -hmm. wasn't even like let's just see what happens it was just we were just doing it and that's just when i just kind of what happened there was no real intention to do anything there was no real desire to do anything it was just let's just do it yeah and it was a lot of this kind of slacker attitude which um you know was kind of popular back then too it was like you want to jam tonight yeah sure and what time it's like well how about midnight you know <laughs> so <laughs> strangely enough when we were originally practicing together it was like really super late at night you know like where i guess most people would jam or at least i don't even know like nowadays we jam like at 10 in the morning it's like we all have kids and it's totally changed but that whole idea of like we're just jamming to have fun or playing music to have fun we're not playing music to get famous was was i think uh important to us at the time Right. So we're talking about a, a very long song this week. And I can, I honestly, I feel like that's kind of the headliner of our interviews to hear what a guy from Godspeed thinks about No Effects is the Decline. But first, I do want to know, you've mentioned that you kind of just let things happen. I'm curious as time has gone on, like how much of the composition element matters? Because I feel like at least from a distance, it seems some of your songs must be planned out, like almost like classical compositions or something. Well, whereas before we were just kind of jamming and letting things happen naturally and letting uh, changes to riffs happen naturally and then trying to figure out how we were going to play them live because, you know, when you change something, someone else needs to know when you're changing. Mm -hmm. So um, whereas before we were just kind of doing it organically and it happening and then we would kind of stop and talk about it and go like oh yeah okay so I'll, I'll just look at you at one point and you know wave at you or nod at you and that's when i'm going to change and we would kind of change and there was a lot of fading in and out kind of naturally or organically and 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 going from one part to the other part that was the kind of general way of doing things in the past in, at the very beginning nowadays we kind of do that a little bit but there's definitely a lot more uh 
counting and deciding on the number of rotations of playing things um, before we get into the studio, or at least when we're in the studio to record things. And then once we've th- once we've done that, we've played it live a million times, and we get sick and tired of playing things twelve times. So when we play, when we record it, we say twelve times is way too long. Let's do it six times. <laughs> you know? So. Um, that's kind of the general idea. Nothing's really composed beforehand in the sense, it's not like someone like myself or Terry comes to the jam space and says, Hey, I got this new composition. I'd like to try out." It's kind of more like someone comes to the jam space and says, Hey, uh, I got a new riff and what do you guys think about it? And so we'll play the riff over and over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, of course people get tired of playing it and kind of change and you hear a, something that someone else is doing which makes you play something else which then all of a sudden turns into a different riff and then next thing you know we're all playing something else and then you know we'll talk about what happened and so um it, a lot of the time it happens organically and but at the same time as we move as we've been moving forward um we do talk more about going from one riff to another mm-hmm. in more definite ways rather than in more organic ways. You know, you mentioned that you started Godspeed in part because you were frustrated with what you were seeing out there and then you kind of organically went in this other direction. But now, so deep into your career as a band, um, it, like you yourselves have influenced culture so much or even like, I hate to say it, but like, you know, mainstream movie soundtracks obviously take from godspeed or from at least a conversation that you started so long ago so are you also ever reacting to your own how you're perceived as a band or anything um i think we're we're very very aware of who we are and what we play and how we play and I think we've grown to accept that, especially (laughs) now that when we've come back together again, Mm -hmm. I think when we were first together in like the early two thousands and late nineties, um, I think we had a hard time accepting that that's what we had become. And we were this, you know, post rock band. Um, (laughs) but nowadays I think we've just kind of, this is what we do. We, this, you know, we, we play long songs and we like playing them. We'd like to consider ourselves a rock and roll band first and foremost and not like a contemporary classical band Mm -hmm. um but we're definitely fully aware of this is what we do you know and at times we'll play something and we'll like at least myself i'll laugh and it's like oh my god what are we doing here you know like this we just we're here we go again here's another 15 minute long song you know (laughs) so i'm we're aware of it it's not like we're not aware of it you know right um but it's fun. Like it, it's super fun. Like I, I love jamming with the seven other people in my band. You know that so, rules. You know I love. I, I've always played right next to Ephraim, so Ephraim's guitar is like you know mind blowingly loud in my uh, right ear, and I love hearing his guitar and 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 playing with him. So, um, he, he, there was a moment maybe 20 years ago when Ephraim started Silvermount Zion and he he played me the first record and I listened to it and I was like okay that's not much different than Godspeed it's like just you solo in a way and I spoke to our tour manager at the time and and Dirk who who passed away uh at the time said you know well what do you expect from Ephraim that's what that you know, like he's not all of a sudden reinvent himself, and that's that's kind of like the way I see ourselves too. It's that you know, like we play the music that we play, and we're not gonna all of a sudden, right, turn into, you know, a skate punk band. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I don't know. I think you might be inspired after this week, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's, that's the idea that somehow just even knowing that you had to listen to the decline to prepare for this is so funny to me, and I'm curious, kind of just. What were your general thoughts? I mean, have you ever, I think you've heard no effects before, obviously, but I mean, how did you, I assume you've never heard the decline until, until this week. Right. (laughs) So (laughs) 
I, I've never, I, I mean, I like pop punk and I used to like uh, a lot of stuff from the early 90s. I used, I used to be a huge Bad Religion fan in the late 80s, I okay. guess. I saw them a couple times and they were one of my favorite bands in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it's changed now and I'm not really too into that kind of music anymore. Um, and, you know, I had heard of No Effects. <laughs> Not like I would be fully aware of if someone played me a song that I would be able to say, oh, yeah, that's no effects. Um, but when Blair told me about this 17-minute 17, 17 long song or 18 or whatever it was, um, I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And I had to listen to it as soon as as soon as they told me about it. And, yeah, it's it's pretty funny. <laughs> I, I, I think it's pretty funny. But, then, you know, the same way as probably everyone else thinks, you know, one of my band's songs is ridiculously you know <laughs> stupid too you know <laughs> well i don't know because i don't think godspeed you know godspeed obviously the uh the field recordings the song titles there's you definitely do use words but i don't think you've ever come up with a term quite as uh evocative as the word greediocracy which is in this song. <laughs> right right I, I listened to some of the lyrics and, you know, like I, I, I talked to Aiden about doing this podcast a few days ago and uh, telling them that, you know, we were going to talk about no effects. And, you know, he said to me, he's like, I, I don't know anything about no effects, but I heard they're really cool guys. <laughs> so it's like, OK, so I, I was listening to the lyrics after that and thinking like, oh, OK, like, yeah, they, I, I, you know, like I try to stay away from, you know, like looking into who people are and stuff. But, you know, when you do hear certain kinds of words and lyrics you kind of um get the sense as to who they are a little bit you know yeah so it was pretty cool i you know i enjoyed it <laughs> what did you think of it kind of in terms of the you know i know you said you you don't necessarily think of yourselves as composers but i i think of this as being a composed piece. this is a composition absolutely like what did you think about the way that it shifted the ebbs and flows do you think they used their 18 minutes well <laughs> well, I thought it was going to be a lot more of a rock opera than it than it was. Like it really was like an eighteen minute long uh, pop punk song, you know. <laughs> yeah. So Blair told me about something they've done with with an orchestra, which I haven't had a time to to listen to. So, and I don't, I haven't read anything about why they decided to write this eighteen minute long song. They must be the, there must have been a reason, you know. They must have decided to do it beforehand because i don't know if pop punk bands think of writing an 18 minute long song to begin with yeah i don't think you just sit down and and write something like this um yeah <laughs> but yeah but who knows maybe they do <laughs> it's true though you're right there's no there isn't really very many like you know uh volume swells or anything in here they they just kind of stay on the same tone most of the time mm -hmm. Well, that's what surprised me. It's like I, I really thought there was going to like be a coming down of something, and then turning into you know like part you know four of the song. But it does seem to be just like uh, straight ahead, eighteen minutes of uh, different different riffs, which is pretty cool. <laughs> it's fun. It's so funny to me to think this came out the same year as uh, Slow Riot for New Zero Canada. It's like just so bizarre to think about how those two things could even exist in the same year. Like it's almost like the like just the production of this must have probably grossed you out pretty bad. Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't know. Is it over? I don't know if it's necessarily overproduced in any way. It, it still sounds like uh, you know two guitars, bass, and drums, or however number of guitars it is. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> I, I mean, I always wondered if, what would happen if a band like this just, like, you know, went to Hotel to Tango or, or like, you know, just go to tape with this kind of stuff. What would that sound like? Right. Well, I, I think if they recorded it at the hotel, they would definitely get a sound that was different than what they're normally sounding like, I would assume, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm not a recording engineer, so I couldn't tell you, you know. <laughs> but what is interesting is that, you know, you bring up this thing about, you know, how it was, how it came out in, uh, in 2000, 2001, when was, what uh, year was 99. it? 99, it was 1999. Wow, you know. So, like, there's this whole idea of, like, you know, we, you know, like, and people keep 
mentioning it every once in a while and it kind of frustrates us where it's like, you know, we were like the creators of, of, of things. And, you know, like we didn't really create this idea of like, let's make 18 minute long songs. Like people were doing it already, you know, and that's, this is a perfect example. You know, this is pop pump band that does a, you know, 18 minute long song in the same year as we're doing it. So uh, I would be maybe surprised if they even had heard of us at the time and they were just doing it completely independently. And, you know, we didn't really create a lot of the stuff. Some of, a lot of the stuff that we made was definitely influenced by a lot of the shit that we were listening to at the time anyways, you know? Mm -hmm. So amazing. Well, I mean, I don't know if there's anything else you, you, that stood out to you about the experience of listening to the decline by no effects, but if there's anything else you want to say about it, now would be a great time. Well, like I said, I still have to listen to this version of, you know, of the song with the orchestra, but you know, we, we often get asked, um, and we've been asked again to do a song, either an old song or a, a new composition with some ridiculous orchestra. And I've never wanted to do that. <laughs> like maybe we will in the future just for a kick, but it's like the, the last thing I want to do is, is to sit in a room with 30 or 40 real musicians. Cause I've never really thought myself as a musician, uh, and try to compose a piece of music with them in mind, you know what I right. mean? Or, you know, it's like, but they did it. And I know that, that it has a lot to do with money and it has a lot to do with somebody saying, Hey, I'll give you guys a hundred grand to do this. Um, and so why would you say no? But we've always been really reticent about this idea of, of uh, turning into a band that plays with an orchestra. I don't uh, know. You don't want to be snooty. No, and that's the thing is that a lot of people really think of us as being like this snooty uh, band, and it's and, it, and I mean, I guess we are snooty for sure. I, I don't want to say that we're not, but you know, are we snootier than other bands? Like you know, like just because we say no to a bunch of interviews and you know, say no to a lot of things versus just saying yes to everything. You know, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, I mean, maybe really what you got to do to hammer home that you're not snooty is instead of working with an orchestra maybe you should collaborate with no effects well you know like my 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 uh i'll i'll, I'll say this and uh it's you know well known to the other band but i've really wanted to do a godspeed neurosis record and uh even to this day i still want to do it i don't know if it'll ever happen but um the idea of collaborating with another band is like for me a awesome idea and especially it being like a rock and roll band, not like some stupid contemporary classical band. <laughs> right. so, you know, that'd be so uh, it's cool. just a question of time. And, and like, that's the other thing too, is that as you get older, it's like these things become less and less important in a way, you know, like mm -hmm. I kind of want to just hang out with my, uh, my kids now and, and garden rather than <laughs> right. being a recording studio. Fair enough. Fair enough. Like, well, I don't see myself I don't see myself as a musician. That's the thing. You know, like a lot of a lot of musicians are like, yeah, I'm a musician. It's like I that's the last thing I see myself as. So <laughs> well you clearly know how to play the bass, don't you? I mean, or are you just kind of like uh pretending in front of a backing well, track? Well you know it's like I I I can I can play what I play and then a lot of the times I'll get together with some whatever friends or cousins or whatever and they like you know play guitar and it's like oh hey let's jam and it's like no man i don't i don't really know how to jam you know and they're like what are you talking about you're a bass player aren't you and it's like yeah but i can't really jam with you you know like i <laughs> know how to play notes but i don't really i don't know i just can't just make so and, then, and then there's like you know other people who like who like all of a sudden just start playing riffs of some other bands and it's like let's jam and it's like Dude, I don't even know what notes you're playing, you know? Like, <laughs> right. I, don't know. I mean, I got to say, the bass playing on The Decline is pretty incredible. I, I'll listen to it more than... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn it to a no effects then. Yeah, I think it's time. I think that should be your kind of, like, you know, gardening, being a dad, and then having, like, a late-era pop-punk midlife crisis. I feel like that could work. I I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> you know when you when when Blair brought up this thing about about doing this podcast, I actually, 
you know, Googled no effects. And, and for me, it's always like the first two or three records of any band are the best records of that band. Mm -hmm. So I listened to their first record and I said to myself, Oh yeah, this is kind of, this is kind of cool. I like, I like this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. It's like totally early nineties, uh, punk music, you know, pop punk. And then, you know, I read a whole bunch of reviews about the record and people saying about how it's like their worst record or it's not their <laughs> best record. And I'm like, what are you talking about that? You know, then I started listening to this other, sh this like later stuff. And I'm like, man, that's what you guys think is good. <laughs> so I totally like that early no effects with the first no effects record. It's like, it's cool. It's great. You know, I played yeah. it for my, uh, for my nine-year-old uh, kid. Cause he's into punk rock and rock and roll music. And um, he said that he liked, everything about it but he thought that the singing was a little rough <laughs> i was like i like rough singing <laughs> yeah. so we had we talked about this whole idea of like you know like what you know what rough singing is or whatever so he's really into nirvana and the ramones right now so oh sick yeah that rules well i mean okay i should probably let you go but before you go i know you kind of hinted that you're not really a plugs kind of guy, but if there is any projects or upcoming things you want to mention before you go, the people can check out. Uh, now's the time. Uh, not really. I mean, we're going on tour in the winter and spring and next fall. So we'll, s I'll see people on the road again, which is always fun times. Amazing. Well, thank you again yeah. for listening to no effects and talking to us about it. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks. Thanks to you.